let's see. And I am going to hit record. Oh, hi, everyone. You. Yeah, let me get the recording started and then we can go. Hi, everyone. Um, okay, sorry. Uh, I, I wasn't sure if we were live. Usually it, it says something else on my screen. But um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Stephen Nunu. I am the K-12 editor at EdSurge, and um, EdSurge is a news and information resource helping you bring the best in education technology through our news stories, our research programs, and our community activities, which include live conferences and events such as this webinar. So thank you so much, everyone, for uh, joining us. And at the end of last year, EdSurge joined ISTE, the International Society for Technology and Education. And ISTE is a nonprofit organization that serves educators interested in the use of technology in education. And so for today's webinar, we've lined up a really great panel on the impact of coronavirus on K-12 education. But today we'll be focusing specifically on summer planning and fall reopening, what schools need to know. A uh, quick note before we begin, this webinar will be recorded and the recording will be made available to you uh, at the in next week, probably. If you signed up for the webinar, you'll also receive updates about recurring webinars on this topic, if, if we have any. And um, you can ask questions throughout the webinar using the Q&A feature in Zoom, and we'll bring those questions into the discussion as we're able. We also encourage you to use the chat to say hello. I see some of you are already doing that and share resources, but please do put those questions for the panel into the Q&A. Um, <clears throat> before we get started, I just wanna draw your attention to a guide from Ed Surge and ISTE called Navigating Uncertain Times, How Schools Could Cope with Coronavirus, which is collecting all of our stories, our contributors, and some really helpful resources uh, so I would encourage everyone to take a look at it. It's online at readiness.edsurge.com. Uh, and you can check out our homepage, edsurge.com, for the latest news. Uh, we update it daily, obviously. Uh, so I'd like to introduce the panelists on today's call. And I'm so honored that they could share their time and their expertise with us on such short notice. So today we are joined by Christina Ishmael. She is the new Director of Primary and Secondary Education at Open Education Global, and she's a research fellow at New America. We have Kelly Chin, the Coordinator for Instructional and Assessment Technology at Oakland Unified School District. And we have Sean Gill, a research analyst at the Center on Reinventing Public Education out of the University of Washington. So welcome everyone, and I just have a few questions and then we can move on into taking some submitted questions. So uh, first to start things off, I wanna talk a little bit about specific plans, but first I think we need some context. Uh, Christina, you co-authored a recent report about scenarios for reopening and it, it was very interesting. It, it had some blended, some, uh, some in-person and some remote possibilities. Uh, and, and the need to be flexible about what we're doing in the fall. Uh, can you start us off by explaining why schools might need multiple scenarios and why they have to plan for multiple eventualities? Yeah, hi everyone. I'm honored to be here with you. Uh, yes, so the report that we put out, Pandemic Planning for Distance Learning, was really born out of frustration, quite honestly, uh, with some friends from grad school that are in a school system that does blended learning as well as an instructional designer for Penn State World Campus. And um, it was, we were hearing these different terms being used kind of interchangeably around distance learning or remote learning or online learning or whatever it may be. 
And I was worried that a lot of teachers were experiencing this and they were thinking that this was online learning. Um, and really distance learning and distance education is a field and has a, a background and, and a history. And so we wanted to talk more about that and, and really look into the definitions. And then as we started to get into that, we talked about the potential scenarios, which is where these four different scenarios came into play. And um, Jenny Payne works at Cherry Creek Public Schools in their blended school and so she spoke to how this is really more planned distance learning and then Rebecca talked about how all of the work that they do on online learning is also planned distance learning. The other two scenarios that we provided was a brick to click which was the idea of that um, folks would start in a brick and mortar school but then quickly be able to pivot to online so a little more forethought and, and planning um, compared to what we've experienced this past um, the past three months, but it's still kind of a low fidelity of distance learning. And then the other one is a click to brick, which is kind of just the reverse where you start online with the understanding that all instruction will be delivered online. But then when you um, could go back in person that it would be really working on relationship building, social emotional health, um, and wellness and um, just more of those executive functioning skills. And so we know that distance learning is going to have to play a role in all of this. And so we wanted to provide kind of elements to consider, which is really how that whole report um, came to be. Yeah, that's great, thanks. Uh, so Sean, you've also done some research uh, looking at school plans. Can you talk about maybe some of the big gaps that schools will need to confront uh, next year? I know you break up um, the districts and the plans that you look at by rural and urban. Are, are there differences between uh, where schools and districts are located? Yeah, we've uh, closely tracked a, a sample at our center which we refer to as SERPI. So if you hear me saying SERPI, that's our organization. Um, we, we closely were looking at a sample of 82 districts that were mostly large urban districts, but we did um, do kind of a point in time analysis of a representative sample, and uh, of which had 477 districts total and is representative of the country. And so uh, you know, based on that sample, we found only 30% of, um, of districts were really requiring instruction uh, and so that's you know, the difference between whether schools were where districts were saying we're going to provide you with assignments and you might turn that in and get feedback it could be packets it could be done online uh, but that instructional opportunity would really be the teacher either doing video um, live or um, posting videos or um, finding other ways to connect uh, so I think that is kind of a big question I think going forward in, in the fall is if we have to have remote learning in our in our districts. And, and we tended to see that instruction was was more likely to be offered in more affluent districts. Um, and, and, and many many of our urban districts, I think, were doing it, but I, I don't have the number in front of me at the moment. But a big question I think going forward as plans are kind of coming together is if remote learning has to remain um, feasible or are part of the planning for districts is then how are they going to think about providing instruction and, and that's perhaps where you're going to see movement towards those sort of hybrid or blended methods where students can come in because certainly uh, I think it's not a surprise probably to anyone on this uh, webinar but uh, you know there was huge questions of access not only getting devices home um, but then do families have internet access is it stable in, in rural areas and even some suburban areas there isn't you know, the same sort of broadband access that you might have in the city uh, so I think that's a, a big question going forward. Yeah, that's that's great. Um, so Kellith, uh, moving on to you, what do you know about how your district is starting to plan for fall and eventualities, and what specifically does that does that mean for for you know education uh, technology um, department such as yours? Well, it's uh, it's complex for sure, and one of the one of the big challenges is just that we don't know exactly uh, what the conditions are going to be. We're we're awaiting um, guidance from from the county, from the state. We're also and and I think as far as the everyone, we're we're waiting to find out what the conditions are going to be like uh, when it's time to start school. So there are a lot of unknown factors right now, and so that's uh, really difficult. But what we are doing right now is we are trying to plan for contingencies and different scenarios. Uh, so we, in, the, in at Oakland Unified, where, um, where I'm the coordinator of instructional technology, we have um, 
what we're calling a COVID-19 action team. And so it's, it really, it consists of somewhere between 90 to uh, 100 uh, people who are teachers, principals, parents, um, central office, staff members. And so we're kind of organizing into teams and um, we're making recommendations, trying to get feedback. And we're really doing a lot to try to engage as many, um, as many stakeholders as possible so that we're really getting um, information and feedback from, from families about what the, what the uh, experience was like for distance learning. We want to know from teachers what worked best and, and what they would like to see. Um, teachers are the, the frontline implementers of whatever plan we're going to have. So it's super important to make sure that they're on board and that they feel comfortable with uh, whatever is, is going to happen. Yeah, so just to follow up on that, Kelleth, uh, in your personal opinion, what worked best and what would you like to see improved upon for the fall? Well, I'll start with uh, what, what we'd like to see improved in the fall is uh, just issues of access. Um, we, frankly, we were not ready uh, when, when, the, uh, when the school closures uh, hit in, in March. Um, it just, it, we had about 24 hours um, notice before we, before we were closed and we basically, we couldn't go back into, into the schools. Um, so we were, not, we were not ready with devices. And then once we did get, it took us, uh, you know, it was really a few weeks before we got most of our devices distributed to students who needed them. Uh, so that, that was a, mostly Chromebooks. And, um, but then on top of that, there were a lot of problems with internet access. A lot of families did not have access to the internet. And there were, um, there, were, there were internet service providers that were offering free access, but that was problematic. A lot of times um, it would, they would be requiring maybe a social security number or ID. There, we do have families who are undocumented. And so that was very um, problematic for them. And um, so that's mainly the, the, really the, the issues of access. I think everyone agrees that's, that's the biggest problem. But then in addition to that on the instructional technology side, uh, one thing that we heard was that um, I, I'm sure that, that a lot of people that are, that are, uh, on, that are on, in this meeting right now, they were besieged with, um, with emails saying, we're here to support you in this, in this time of crisis and we, would, we want to offer you free resources. So it was kind of like everybody had, was just, uh, had a flood of resources and it was just very overwhelming for everyone. Uh, so that was one thing that we heard is that we'd, we'd like to just kind of streamline what's available and where the support is available so, so that um, teachers and, and families, they don't have to make this uh, very difficult choice about like how to proceed. So we're, we're really looking to just have a better plan right now. We did the best that we could with uh, just the short time, we, but a lot of it was just kind of um, throwing spaghetti at the wall and there was too much spaghetti. Right, yeah. Um, so Sean, when we had spoken earlier, you had mentioned that trends are still kind of hard to parse because uh, districts don't know, like Kellef was just saying, that there's still a lot of uncertainty um, how can districts uh, start to plan when uh, there, there are no trends for them to follow? So any decisions they make, they, they're going to feel like trailblazers. Yeah, I, I do think states are starting to put out guidance um, or, or in, you know, in other regional education agencies like the county offices in California. Um, the, so, so there's starting to be guidance, but I think it's sort of more like, well, this is how you would approach the decision. It's not sort of saying clearly it was interesting to me yesterday in Washington State, the, the superintendent of public instruction, the statewide leader uh, who is elected, and then also the governor, Jay Inslee, you know, they were saying, we, we expect schools to be open. Um, but if you, when I looked at the guidance, I was like, I don't, I don't actually see that in there. So I think, um, I think there's still certainly contingency planning is what I'd recommend. And uh, one thing that we've noticed is that seems to be a positive trend is a lot of districts are doing outreach. So they are um, having virtual listening tours, they have surveys. Uh, I've seen Baltimore City Schools has done Facebook chats. Um, so I, th I think districts are making a really good 
effort to um, ask families, well, what do you want? Because there's, there does seem to be um, a lot of varied opinions. You know, there's, there's families that are like, we, we can't work and have our children at home. Uh, we can't go back to work or even if we're trying to do work, it's just not going to be feasible all year long. Um, but then other families are saying, well, we're, we're not going to send our children uh, until there's a vaccine or a, a therapeutic option. So, uh, you know, so districts are probably going to need to think about, can we provide different options? And, and one thing might be is to say, well, can different schools provide different options? And I think Oakland is an interesting example of a district where some of the remote learning that happened this fall was really kind of left up to schools to design and communicate to parents. And that's really great. Uh, I would just encourage districts then to say, if you're going to have some um, variety or different options at your different school levels, think about how families could then find the right fit for them, especially if you're in a larger district um, where there's a number of campuses and it's not too difficult to go to a different elementary school. Harder, I think, in, in rural and some of the suburban districts, but you could also think about maybe a district should provide a virtual option or look to your state. There's um, the state of Alaska is, is kind of trying to, to work with the state of Florida, which actually has a virtual school uh, that's not for profit, it's run by the state. Um, and they're trying to think about, well, how can we adapt some of that for Alaska so that if there is a certain segment of our population, maybe 10, 15% that does want to remain uh, full time at home or virtual or in some kind of homeschooling hybrid, um, that we're able to support those families. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, Christina, in, in that recent report, you had a pretty large section for considerations for the future. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about those and what schools should be prioritizing as they're kind of working through state guidance? Yeah, and once again, this was, <laughs> I want to start with the premise that we didn't have the answers, but we had a lot of questions. And so that's really where these came from. And we talked a lot about operations and, and administration, professional learning, of course, because we realized that that is going to be ongoing, of course, um, policy, assessment, informational technology, like all of these kind of components, um, our instructional strategies, realizing that we can't simply digitize a face to face experience um, and what does that look like as far as different strategies or models that we can employ as well as looking at special populations and how we engage our um, parents and caregivers in all of this and so within each of these kind of buckets um, there are more questions to hopefully spark conversation with leaders and if they are putting together kind of a task force or a team um, that they can have these conversations with parents, with students. Hopefully, I heard, I heard like the team coming together. I'm hoping that student voices are also included in all of this um, because we're hearing a lot around like students that are thriving in these environments, but also students that are not. And so hopefully they also get to voice um, what is working for them or what isn't working for them and letting the, the school systems know. Um, and so again, it's a list of more questions to consider, um, but hopefully a starting place for folks. Yeah. Um, Kellett, do you have a sense about what is working and not working for students and families? Uh, I think it's a, there's, it really depends. There's, there's not really a, a one size fits all answer. That's, um, that's, it's difficult uh, because there are, um, there are families where there's a lot more support that's available. Um, and there are families that where um, family members might be going through some kind of crisis. They might be out of work or they might be needing to work. They might be essential workers. So it really depends on this, the, uh, the student, the family, the situation. Um, we do, uh, we have seen that, um, that small group instruction is, is really appreciated. One-to-one -on, one -one, uh, instruction is really appreciated also. Uh, just making sure that there are check-ins, just emphasizing connection uh, is really important. It's really important to remember that even though we're thinking about instruction and on, online learning, that we're, um, we're going through a crisis right now and there's a lot of trauma that's happening right now. So really the, the first priority needs to be wellness and, uh, and connection, social, emotional uh, health. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's great. So I wanted to shift and talk a little bit about the summer and how we can kind of use 
this time to shore up learning and planning and um, what the best use of summer uh, is. Sean, you um, have a separate report talking about summer as an opportunity to build something different. Um, can you talk a little bit about what you mean uh, as, as summer as an opportunity for schools and districts? Yeah, we, we really looked um, about the same district of 82 that we're kind of tracking, but a, a larger, I think we have around 100. Um, we're really looking to see, like, are they going to use summer to um, address learning loss or social emotional learning um, and, and or potentially uh, try new strategies, try blended strategies. I would say for the most part, the, um, the programs we're seeing and, you know, some schools are still in session. So uh, last I checked, it could change, but Chicago hadn't posted its summer school plan yet. So I don't know what every district is, is doing yet. but. For the most part, they were sort of um, taking existing programs and uh, usually a lot actually are still virtual. And I think that just kind of speaks to the, the um, uncertainty around uh, even, in, even in states that are, um, you know, able, are reopening Texas, a lot of the, the, the districts there are still doing virtual summer school. So we ha I think we haven't seen as much of, um, from what we can tell based on, on websites and other communications, we haven't seen as much about saying, let's really address learning loss. Certainly a lot of summer programs are meant to be um, review or remedial or, or even address kids who didn't um, get promoted to fourth grade from third grade, for example, because they didn't meet reading standards, which is, is a thing in a couple of states. Um, so so that, those programs I think will be good. That, the other thing is in a lot of the programs tend to be more at high school and they're sort of in that concept of credit recovery. And there's certainly a lot of literature and debate about credit recovery programs. Um, but that, that potentially will help, I think, some students remain on track because there were more, it's likely, we saw a lot of districts were still giving grades or they were giving incompletes. So if you're getting an incomplete, even if it's not a fail, that's, you still don't have the credit that you would need to graduate. So hopefully that would allow um, some students to remain on track and, and, and potentially those credit recovery programs would address, you know, actual you know, knowledge and learning that we want them to have more than just the credits. Um, the, the last part about sort of like the opportunity to innovate, I think we were hoping to see, um, or we're really curious to see if districts would say, oh, this is where we can test out sort of a blended model. And I, there's a couple of districts that I think later in July um, might do that with uh, elementary in particular, but they're gonna say, we'll have four days um, in school or in physical and then the, the fourth day, of, excuse me, the fifth day, Friday, will be at home. So that is where you might start to see people experimenting with those different models. And certainly summer is usually not, um, it's usually not required. We, and we haven't really seen anyone, we've seen schools say it's recommended for you to come or you, if you need the credit, certainly those students are gonna go. Um, but it hopefully is a smaller population so that there is a little bit more opportunity for um, the small groups and the FaceTimes and the, the check-ins. And I would say that the concept of just having teachers do check-ins is, is a great thing that districts could do. And um, it's, or virtual office hours is another way to do it. Um, but that is a relatively low tech thing. We've seen districts try to do that with just phone calls or you know maybe even doing some home visits. It can be really powerful for families. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Christina, anything to add uh, to that about seeing summer as an opportunity? I think it really is an opportunity for us. I mean, obviously the small groups um, are certainly helpful given social distancing guidelines that we have so far. Um, conversations that are happening right now a lot in, um, in early education are if we're having our students with disabilities or our um, EL students, as well as like even our youngest learners um, coming in, the requirements of face masks and the importance of being able to read faces. And so I'm hearing a shift in conversations around even PPE using face, um, the shields, so that students can see full faces and start to recognize that. And that does play a huge part in social emotional health and development, um, as well as just developmentally appropriate practices. I'm a former early childhood and elementary teacher, and I'm like, yes, you can see my face. Um, and that's really important. So I think, um, yeah, I think that is really, really important when we're talking about this. But the small groups, I think, is, is a great kind of way for us to see if this will work. The one thing that I'm hearing is that um, some schools are considering shutting down libraries, which terrifies me um, to use as more space for people to use. Um, and I would be like, no, please don't do that. Um, I'm a huge advocate for our school libraries and our school librarians and all the work that they do. And so I hope that that's not something that 
a lot of people will be <laughs> turning to, but I also understand the distancing may be required for that. And so um, now we get to, I guess, test it out. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Uh, so Kelleth, you had talked a little bit about what OPEN is doing. You have that uh, committee of 90 to 100 stakeholders that are making decisions this summer. What, what about you and your department? Uh, what are you going to be working on specifically this summer with your staff? Well, you know, one of the things that we, uh, there were a lot of lessons that were, that were learned during this period of school closures. And uh, we really felt that we learned a lot that we can use going forward, even beyond school closures. Um, one thing that we really learned is that it's really possible to have a lot more uh, collaboration within the district. We have, we have uh, 84 schools in our district. And for the first time, we were really coming together as a district, sharing more resources. Um, we started Google Classrooms for teachers so that for each grade level or subject area, there was a Google Classroom and we shared resources with all first grade teachers or all Algebra 2 teachers. And uh, that was really exciting. And it was one of the, one of the first times that we've, we've done something like that, really the first time. So we'd like to um, just spend more time shoring up those resources and improving communication. Uh, one thing is that, you know, to, to really keep in mind, at least from, from our perspective, is that um, there's, there's really, for example, a, a fourth grade lesson in, in fractions. Um, that's something that can be utilized if, we, if there's a really good lesson or there's a really good video. That's something that can be utilized by many, many teachers across the district. There's no reason that we can't put those resources, a really good lesson plan, a really good video online. So we're really doing our best to try to shore up those resources, get those organized this summer. And that's also something that, um, that can be used to, no matter what the scenario is. If we come back, uh, if, we, if everyone were just to go back to school or if everyone were just doing distance learning or if there was some kind of hybrid model, those kind of resources could be used in any of those scenarios. So that's really what we're, uh, one of the things that we're really working on is shoring up those instructional resources and putting them online. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's really interesting. So uh, just a quick follow up, Kelleth, um, you know, assessment is also part of your title. Uh, is there any thought to how you're going to be assessing learning gaps? You, you mentioned earlier that every student is different during this time because they have different needs. Are, are you giving thought to how students, you know, you, you might discern with, with how big those learning gaps are? Yes, that is, that's something that we're talking about. And, and again, you know, we're, we're trying to balance uh, just the facts that, you know, we're, we've, we've got the instructional piece and then we've got the social emotional piece and then there's, there's assessment also. Um, so we're trying to figure out, um, you know, one of the, one of the things that teachers in our, our district, uh, a lot of people are feeling is that just in general, um, feeling overwhelmed by assessments, even in normal times. Uh, so we're really trying to balance, especially because we're we've got this, we've got uh, just a, a really different situation that's likely to be coming up in in the fall. But we do want to make sure that we've got some kind of assessment in place, even if it's uh, something that's a little bit more, I guess you could say, lightweight or something that's quicker, just to get uh, just a quick sense of where students are are, are at. Uh, so we're we're talking about what the different scenarios are and what that should look like. And can yeah. I just add on the assessments? We, I mean, that's something we have kind of wondered if the state really, states should really take the lead on. Um, and, and assessment might not be this right word, some kind of diagnostic tool or framework. Um, we've, we've, we're going to hopefully track this this summer, but we've been a little bit curious to see some states are like, oh, you could just use the state test or adapt the standardized test. And that really is not going to work. Um, I'm sure if there's teachers on the call, they, <laughs> they would tell you like, we don't get that data. I mean, you're lucky to get that data the next year by the, and the students are already gone. So I, I would hope that states would take the lead on this because knowing that every district uh, or charter school or even private schools needs um, some kind of new um, way, a quick way, but a, a new way to sort of adapt uh, the loss that we expect to see and, and, and all prior research would suggest there is going to be some learning loss or summer slide, an extended summer slide. Um, 
uh, so that, that then you can differentiate because I think the, um, the experience that students had is just going to be so varied. Um, and even in Chicago, there's a report recently where it's two schools nearby, same demographics. One was, was much more highly engaged. Students were doing more assignments. And so it, was, it just speaks to the fact that even in, this, in one district, um, even in uh, one school or classroom, you could have a, a lot of kids who had a lot more exposure to learning and a lot less. And so hopefully you would be able to identify those students who had the biggest gaps and really target um, some of your most intensive instruction to those students. Yeah, yeah. So that, that, that sounds like it would take a lot of um, flexibility. Um, Christina, is it possible for districts to be that flexible? I hope. <laughs> uh, so I, I used to work at the Nebraska Department of Education. And honestly, from all of my work with districts across the country, I would say the more rural and smaller districts are actually at an advantage for this kind of stuff because they just have the ability to be more agile in all of this, whether it was introducing ed tech and making them one-to-one -one kind of environments right away or new kind of instructional strategies or models that are being implemented. Um, I think they do. I, larger systems are harder. They just are um, in general, whether it's funding or increased um, numbers of special populations, whatever, whatever it may be, it is more difficult. But I think it's I think it's doable. I think it's also an opportunity when you think about um, funding streams, um, thinking about Title IV-A in particular, and this is where EdTech kind of comes in, um, they call out the opportunity for people to develop co-ops and work together because we're better together in all of this. Um, I know that there can be competition between school districts and, and kids moving from one district to another and potentially losing that funding stream. I recognize that. However, we're also here to educate kids. Um, and so if I can share things from a larger suburban or urban school system with a large or a smaller rural school and vice versa, um, this is where my whole belie you know, belief in open comes into play. And then I think that we all have the opportunity to, um, to take advantage of that and we should. So if that is a school district that is um, creating diagnostics right now, I mean, in kindergarten, I would give a diagnostic to see what you know, information they knew when we did ongoing kind of benchmark testing. And so I think that is definitely an opportunity for us and hopefully school districts are ready to kind of share and work together to do that. Yeah, no, thank you for highlighting um, cooperative projects. Now that's, that's mm -hmm. super, super important. Um, are, are there any uh, specific ones that you, that you know about or are these just being arranged on local levels? I think more at the local level. Um, I know that there's also a, a big play for our um, service agencies, the educational service agencies. Um, so in California, it's the county offices, you know, throughout. I'm currently in Omaha, Nebraska. I worked with the educational service unit here. Um, and there is a national organization that helps oversee these. And so they help provide all the professional learning as well as special education services. But I think they can help kind of rally everyone because they already work with a number of school districts in that system. So San Diego County, for example, already works with 40 plus school districts. Bring them together. That includes San Diego County, which is the second largest district in the entire state. Um, let's bring them together so that the smaller districts in the same county can, can reap the benefits of all of that. Yeah, that also might be helpful going back to your report because, uh, you know, so much depends on local infection rates in a yeah. specific you know area geographic area and so school yep. districts like in san diego county might be able might be better positioned to work together because infection rates might be similar across you know districts absolutely yeah absolutely things for us uh, to keep in mind for sure yeah so uh, sean you've uh, also looked at a lot of um plans, you've looked at summer plans, you know, distance learning plans, what separates a, a really great exemplar plan uh, from, from what you've seen? Yeah, I think, I think the plans that we kind of felt were complete were the ones that, um, and almost all districts got to the place where they were able to provide curriculum to the majority of their students, so that these kids were actually getting assignments, but they had those assignments and then there's feedback on the assignments, so there was a way whether it was virtual or it was um, kids, you know, sometimes kids are taking pictures of, of assignments and they'd send it to the teacher. The teacher was only able to give feedback. And then lastly, it's that instructional piece. I will say, I think districts that were also really ahead of the game, Miami-Dade Miami comes to mind, is they were really 
rethinking attendance. And so they did, um, I believe in that district, they did require attendance and there's, there's a separate debate to be had about what do you say to families about is attendance required or not. But using, um, using attendance and thinking about student engagement, so the, the districts that I think really will be in a better position are the ones that we're already starting to think about, well, what is the data that we have? And it's not just logins, um, it's, but it's the sort of the teacher contacts and the, the assignments that are being submitted. Um, that's where Chicago kind of does know some differences, even though they didn't take attendance officially, they do know a lot about that. Um, those, those would be the districts that I think are better positioned. Uh, you know, there, there is, uh, uh, you know, in, I think in Chicago and other, other places, it's probably around 15% of students were sort of just not engaged. And uh, I don't want to put blame on anyone. That's, that's sort of the, the nature of the world we're in at the moment. But those are the students that are probably the ones we should be worried about the most. Um, and, you know, for, quite frankly, they're, they're more likely to be poor, they're more likely to be black or Latino. So that, you know, it's, it's a big equity concern. Yeah, yeah. Um, Kelleth, uh, in, in your district, is there any thought to, you know, helping struggling students uh, when, when classes resume or, or thoughts about how to help them specifically? Well, one of the things that we're thinking about specifically with a hybrid model in, in which um, st students would be coming in uh, kind of in a, uh, in a staggered way or kind of in shifts is giving priority to those students that, uh, that need the most help. If they need uh, intervention services, SPED students, newcomers, English language learners, um, those would really be the students that we want to, um, that we want to address their, their needs the most. Uh, because they're being um, the most impacted by the uh, by school closures and distance learning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I, I want to talk a little bit about professional development. And Christina, you had brought this up earlier as something that might be ideal for summer, might be an opportunity for summer. Can you um, describe what that professional development might look like? I mean, should it be instructional strategies for um, educators, I mean, what kind of professional development is most needed right now? Right now, yeah. So I think this is where we can talk about a slow roll <laughs> um, and or even in the work that I do around open education where we move away from traditional materials to open educational resources. We talk about, you know, small steps lead to big wins. And so it, while we're on a faster track right now, we also have to realize we can take advantage of the folks that are already in our systems. Um, and so not always relying on outside services, especially with looming budget cuts. Um, but we, we've kind of categorized two different ways of, that we were looking at professional learning, particularly for this summer. And um, so technical training and more pedagogical training. And so the technical training can be done in short bursts. It can be done synchronously where we're in a face-to-face -face kind of environment, whether it's online or if we're safely distanced in a physical space, but we're looking at learning management system basics. And that could be how to push things out through Google Classroom or using Canvas or whichever LMS we may be doing, upholding student data privacy, as well as acceptable and responsible use policies, instructional informative assessment tools, um, whether you are a G Suite or a Microsoft district, do you have access? Do you know how to access all of the applications as well as video conference tools and multimedia creation? Because we know engagement automatically increases when we're pulling in primary sources, photos, videos, et cetera. Then more of the pedagogical things, we were looking at online course design. Again, moving away from digitizing um, working with some principals in Chile right now that have literally scanned um, PDFs of the, the workbooks. And I know that that is actually not just common, you know, in other countries, that's common here in the US as well. Um, but how can we provide more, ro um, more robust, interactive, engaging kind of opportunities? And so that may require changes to the way that we present information, giving students more voice and choice in the way that they learn, um, as well as looking at social emotional learning strategies and interventions. How are we making sure that kids that are in an MTSS process are able to continue to receive the services and the interventions that they need to push them further along and, and help with their growth? Yeah, yeah. Um, Sean, have you seen um, uh, plans or have you seen schools or districts um, ad address professional development in any way? 
it's it's one thing we are are tra tracking, um, and we haven't again we haven't completed our assessments or our first scan even for districts for the fall. But it, it certainly is something we um, are hoping to see. And I think one of the other things that we're interested in seeing is if if there's training for parents. Um, and there have been some, I think, interesting online modules where, where school districts have sort of said, well, we'll use, this is a good opportunity to use online learning to kind of provide some information. I don't know how um, widely used those tools have been, but, you know, really we've, we've uh, a colleague said, you know, parents have been called to be co-educators in this time. And uh, certainly if there's parents on the call, I think it's, 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 you know, it's providing support, it's making sure that kids are logged in, it's sort of keeping track of the schedules. Um, and so there's a lot that I think districts could just some basic steps that they could probably take just to say like, hey, um, and it's probably things that districts sometimes do at parent academies or parent trainings, um, but it is sort of like, here's how to help be a partner. One area that is an interesting th thing to think about, and, and there's some preliminary data I've seen, not, we didn't collect it, but others collected it, that. Um, students uh, in middle school and high school actually reported more frustration perhaps than elementary students, um, which is kind of the reverse of what we've heard a lot. We, you know, we sort of think, oh, it's hard for a second grader to be in front of a Zoom all day. Um, but it's, it's actually, it might be suggestive of the fact that uh, when you're a second grader, your parent probably can redirect you pretty easily or <laughs> help you out uh, with reading or, or some of the math. Uh, when you start to get into middle and high school, that's where um, teachers really have uh, expert content knowledge, you know, they're specialized. Um, and so it's unlikely that parents can really support those students as well. But it would be interesting to think about, well, what are the strategies we can um, train parents on so that it's maybe it's prompting students to check in with their teacher uh, or, you know, find a study group, those types of things. Yeah, yeah, those are those are some some really great examples. Um, Telleth, uh, have you been pleased with the way Oakland has been doing professional development, and uh, what what's kind of the idea for going forward? Well, um, I'll tell you that um, one of the one of the silver linings about this whole period is that um, that professional development has really taken off, and really video conferencing, Zoom, has been a game changer. Um, we've had a lot of difficulty um, with attendance for uh, professional development in the past with in-person in professional development. We have sessions and it's hard for teachers. You know, we'd, Oakland's a pretty big city. It's hard to drive, find uh, parking, uh, have to go take care of my kids afterwards, don't have time to do that. Um, and it's really made things a lot easier. We've had, uh, we had, a, we had a series of 36 uh, professional development webinars during the school closures. There was one every day. We had every day at 11 a.m. And, uh, and we had really good attendance and it was very, very well received. We had, had it on a variety of topics. It was anywhere from Google Classroom to specific content-based uh, ed tech platforms to also things like social, emotional um, wellness. Um, so we really think that this is something that is is really going to change the way that we do things going forward. And so we actually re, uh, renewed a contract for Zoom so that we can go forward and have a lot more professional development in this way. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's really great. Um, so we are getting a few questions about tracking student attendance. Um, Sean, are there, uh, have you seen um, districts address this or are there challenges in um, tracking student attendance because online is making up so much of what, uh, what we're doing these days? Yeah, I, th I think, again, it, re it really varies. And I think um, districts are, I probably are still trying to figure out what is, what is the right balance of sort of saying, we want students, we want you to be here. This is required <laughs> uh, versus acknowledging the fact that Students um, can't always, if there's only one computer at home, they can't always be on at the same time. Um, and, or sometimes the time that a parent is available to help them is late at night or later in the evening. So I think um, a lot of, some districts have said, no, we're not re requiring attendance. Um, but then you, the, the concept of attendance, I think, shifts in remote learning anyway. And so you'd still want to see, well, stu are students progressing through the assignments and the curriculum and engaging with the teachers? That's probably more important information for, for you. 
um, the sort of questions of attendance is sort of, you know, what do we do about, you know, I think in many ways it doesn't make sense to think about truancy laws or anything like that at this point in time. Um, you know, and then some states are sort of still require attendance or they have the seat time or instructional days. You know, there's, it's fair to say there's been, uh, you know, universal flexibility on that, you know, and, and I, I don't know of any state that has said, you know, no state at this point is saying you have to make up days you missed in the, in the spring, but they, they, some of them did say you have to then provide in e-school or remote learning, um, you know, and that's where we did some, see some variation. It took some districts a while to get going on that. Um, so I, I think on the sort of state accountability mechanism or the funding mechanism, it's probably something we, you know, I would say to state leaders would like to see you push more definitive um, information about that and and sort of allow allow districts to have some flexibility in how they demonstrate that students are engaging. But I, I think I saw in the chat, someone said, we get funded on average daily attendance. Um, yeah, I, I have to imagine that the bigger states that do that have flex, flex that this um, year, but that's something they should think about going forward is like ADA is probably not um, the best way to fund schools at this point in time. <laughs> you probably want to move to more of an enrollment measure. Um, and then you put some other strings on districts to sort of demonstrate enrollment, and, you know, and, and collecting that data on engagement, making sure that you no know, particular subgroup of students is falling behind. There's another great question about special ed. You know, think about how your um, diverse learners, your students with disabilities, or students who are English learners are learning. Um, but maybe not be so strict on the sort of like you have to collect attendance at 9 a.m. and then that gets reported up to whoever and that's how you get your funding. Yeah, yeah, that's that's certainly a, a, a good suggestion. Um, Christina, do, does it still make sense to be doing seat time? Uh, some, of, some of the models did have um, you know, some of the scenarios that you had laid out in your report, it did have, you know, in-person versus online. D does seat time make sense in any of those scenarios? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, but I, I also have to preface with some context in my answer, working at the state level here in Nebraska, um, there was kind of, there was a misunderstanding around seat time. Of course, there's always the, the traditional Carnegie units, um, but for school accreditation purposes, there was not actually seat time in the law that was that was actually in place. Um, it was actually the athletic association that pushed for a certain number of hours that a student had to be in school in order to be eligible to play. So I think it's important to understand that there are kind of different ways of executing or even thinking about the seat time necessarily. Um, I learned a lot from Jenny Payne who works in a blended school in order to answer this question, which was when they are physically in the building together, they will take attendance, but they're only taking attendance one day a week. And then all of the other time they've shifted to participation and that is submission of assignments or if they are connecting during synchronous classes like this on zoom or if they are having like independent like learning groups or small group instruction with the with the teacher. Um, the attendance is kind of collected in that way through their participation and so um, no, and there should not be an expectation to have kids in a zoom for four to six hours every day. That's just not realistic. I think we've figured that out by now, but it's also not good practice. Um, and so you all know your attention spans. Please don't do that to children. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we did try to look to see if, if districts are communicating sort of expectations. Um, and it's, it's really hard to know. I, I think that communicating some expectations of how often students should be engaged is, is useful, but certainly I would agree, don't make it a, a requirement and seat time. Even before this crisis, I think uh, a lot of the evidence and policy work was, was kind of on the idea that like, seat time is not what we care about. Uh, and mm -hmm. everyone knows, you know this, you can be in school and not engaged. Um, and so that's, let's move, I would say, let's move away from that. This is a great time to move away from that and really say, let's, let's track student engagement, let's track student participation. And, um, and ultimately we want those learning outcomes as well, um, however you, you track that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, has, has tracking uh, engagement been a, a focus for Oakland, Kella? Well, we did not use our, our regular um, attendance tracker during the school closures, but we're actually experimenting with that during summer school. 
we have, uh, we've got 36,000 in our district and we've got about 3,000 that are doing summer school right now. Um, so we're experimenting. We've got our, uh, our student information system, attendance tracker uh, working. So we're trying to find out, okay, is this working? Like what are the best practices? And one thing we're really thinking about is that, you know, if, a, if you can't get in touch with the students and you're marking them absent, absent, that should not be something that they're penalized for, but that should be more of a flag to find out, okay, hey, we need to get in touch with, uh, find out what's going on with that student. Are, do they not have internet connection? Do they, uh, are they okay? Um, do they have a device? So that's really uh, how we're trying to think about attendance right now. Can I just add one example on that is Miami Dade looked at um, a, attendance data or however they were doing it with their size. Um, and they, they noticed, they noted that um, a, a lot of students who were experiencing homelessness were not engaged. Uh, and when they followed up, they realized that in some of the shelters that those students were, were living, uh, internet access was not allowed as a sort of a, a privacy mechanism. You know, I don't know if the students were domestic violence situation or what have you. And so they, they worked then with those shelters to think about, well, how do we get access to these students or how do we relax some of these restrictions? Because of course, nobody didn't want, nobody wanted those students to be um, not able to participate. And that was a really great example of, you know, using data, diving in and, and something that a system can do probably a little bit better than, than an individual school. So there's definitely a balance of you. Yeah. You want to empower your, principals and teachers to do things, but there's also a lot your system can do. Yeah, yeah, no, this, this is really fascinates me, this, this idea that Kellis was talking about, about, you know, taking compassionate attendance versus attendance as a, as a perfunctory measure to, to get funding. Um, Christina, do you see an, an opportunity for that to continue? Even, could, could this be an, a new thing about, about taking compassionate attendance, checking in with students, social emotional learning? I think so. There's great potential, you know, with, I think, just the increased awareness of mental health and social emotional learning over the past, I would say, three to five years. Um, more state chiefs are talking about this and how they can either embed this in actual curricular standards um, or bring in kind of in additional pieces. And um, they're, they're more open to it, I think, now than we previously have been. And so um, more considerations at the policy level, whether that's through federal um, kind of recommendations because uh, they're also talking about all of this surprisingly um, and so I think it's important that more states are having the conversation at the state level but then are also making exceptions and starting to kind of implement them down at the local level for sure yeah yeah that's that's really great. Uh, Kelly, I, I wanted to ask you a little bit about uh, technology procurement. Um, has, has that, to, you, you talked a little bit in, in the beginning about just getting deluged by ed tech companies asking you to consider new software. Um, has, has this changed how you normally do procurement um, for this time of year? Uh, well, yes, it, it definitely has. Um, we, are you talking about when you're talking about technology procurement? Procurement? Do you mean hardware? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I mean, so that's not necessarily the same as software, but yeah, I, I, I was referring to specifically the hardware and the, and the refresh cycles that you that you typically would be engaged in. Yeah. Well, we we've already just uh, even before any of this started, we had a um, we're we're having um, a lot of difficulty just with our our Chromebook um, inventory and the aging out um, expiring Chromebooks. Uh, so that's been a big issue, and then it was even a bigger issue um, with the with the school closures. Um, we were we were very f fortunate that um, there was a very generous donation that Jack Dorsey from uh, from Twitter made. Um, we were trying to raise twelve million dollars um, for for Oakland Unified, and Jack Dorsey um, made a ten million dollar donation, not just to Oakland Unified, but to all Oakland public school students. Um, so that was that that's uh, going a long way toward closing that gap. Um, but then there's also there's a supply chain problem in addition to that. Right. Then, so it's not like you can just place an Amazon, an Amazon order for um, 10 million dollars to get Chromebooks for everyone. And then also uh, once you have the Chromebooks, there's the Internet access issue. And so that's difficult. So. Um, there's just a lot of challenges and it's, it's not the kind of thing where you can just like flip a switch or if you just have the money, 
all happens. It's it's a very um, very complex problem, and so we're just trying to work work through it piece by piece. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we, we've seen some comments in the uh, Q and A and the chat about um, the potential for some families being comfortable sending their kids in person, some families not being comfortable sending their kids in person. So uh, di districts might need kind of like this hybrid model where they're offering some students um some some in-person instruction and other students 100 percent online instruction is that another scenario christina that uh districts should be considering right now i think it is but i think it also comes back to a policy conversation unfortunately uh nebraska does not actually allow for online instruction um omaha public schools my former school district was testing this out with a virtual school. And, um, but that was only offered to students that were homeschooled within the attendance area of Omaha. Um, and they could kind of give it a try with electives or certain higher level courses that weren't um, typically available for homeschoolers. Um, but that was to change the actual policy and go to the legislature and ask for changes in the policy. So it, you, you're gonna have to look into it. It's not just gonna be a simply a, hey, these children are deciding not to come back to our school system. So what are we going to do? Um, you're going to have to look at what the law actually allows. Um, so that will require some potential changes. Uh, but the offer should certainly be there um, for folks. And you may also see um, people that choose to homeschool and provide their own options in, in place of staying within their public school system. And that is completely valid as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, Kelleth, is there any uh, thought to if you get requests like that from from parents? Is that something that the that the stakeholder group is thinking about? Uh, definitely, for sure, we want to be um, we want to accommodate uh, everyone. You know, there are just a lot of even with uh, the distance learning piece, um, there there are just different levels of comfort for everyone. Um, there are some one of the things that I wanted to to mention is just a, as far as attendance and distance learning is that a lot of times um, students or families, they're not comfortable being part of a Zoom meeting because maybe there's a lot that's going on in the background at, at, at home. So just different, um, different families have different comfort levels as far as just whether it's in-person learning for safety reasons or distance learning. And so we, uh, we want to be flexible and be able to accommodate uh, different needs. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. A anything you're seeing, um, Sean, just um, from the data in in general? Um, I, I guess we only have like a, another minute left. Yeah, you know, I, I I haven't seen a whole lot yet. We're still we're still kind of figuring districts are still kind of figuring this out. Um, but I, I would say, yeah, the the there's going to need to be more options, and um, just think about you know, don't. I would suggest don't try to overload each teacher with the having to provide those three scenarios, you know, and it's, it's a probably uncomfortable conversation to have in some districts, but it's like, think about those teachers that are ready to go back, do some kind of combination modified schedule, and then think about those teachers that maybe can't go back for their own health or their own reasons, and maybe they're the ones that can do some of the virtual, even if that means they're at school in their classroom. Um, where they have you know good internet technology but talking to kids at home is something i would encourage districts to think about how do we start to differentiate the, what the different campuses offer and then how do we facilitate parents finding the campus that's going to be the best fit for them yeah no that's that's great uh thank you all three of you so much um for your, your time, your insights today. Again, my name is Steven Nuno. I'm the K-12 editor here at EdSurge, and we provide the latest resources and news about how technology is shaping the ways we learn and teach. Please sign up for our new free newsletters or find more resources at edsurge.com. And for to check out more of our webinars, we've hosted a big series. Um, please go to edsurge.com slash e slash webinars. We'll be sending that follow-up email next week and uh, we'll keep you updated if we host future webinars. Thank you so much, everybody, and have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.